when I um, teach courses on this, I really do survey on how students perceive China, whether it's really a global power or not. And um, interestingly, many foreigners tend to think China is already a global power. But many Chinese students, they think China is not yet, and it's rather a developing country, okay? It, it is not the most original power. So maybe the Chinese modesty, uh, modesty is pay, playing a role here, or maybe um, people from outside having a more uh, exaggerated view about China's power. But in any case, I think um, China is rising into a global power. Okay, whether we uh, want to acknowledge it or not, um, it is a global power already. So today's uh, lecture, I think, um, here's the uh, main structure. So first, we need to think about uh, China's rise in historical perspective, okay? And then we will look at China's rise in multiple dimensions. Um, and last, about China's changing worldviews. How it views the world, how it views itself in the world, okay? So he, uh, these are the three main um, themes in this lecture. So first, about China's rise in historical perspective. Well, actually, when we talk about China's rise, this is not the first time, okay? And I don't think it will be the last time either. Um, if we look at the long history of China, actually, um, China had risen several times and then fallen and then rise again, okay? And I suppose India is similar. Um, with many, uh, with countries with such, um, for countries with such long history, we always see this kind of cycles, right? So here, actually, I, I just borrow um, the arguments uh, from a famous Chinese scholar, uh, Wang Gengwu. He actually, is his uh, arguments here, okay? Actually, he believed that uh, the current rise of China is only the fourth rise throughout the Chinese history. So in the past, actually, China um, had risen three times. The first rise occurred in 221 BC, that was the unification of China in the Qing Dynasty. That was the first time when China became a unified country. And um, actually, why China is called China today may have to do with the name Qing, okay, the Qing Dynasty. Um, and actually, that was the time when China became unified in terms of territory, in terms of language, and the currency, okay. And that unification of China actually really influenced the history in the next 2,000 years, okay? And uh, if uh, China were not united at that time, perhaps China would be more like India nowadays, <laughs> with different languages um, and um, very different culture across the um, states. But in any case, so the first rise of China uh, lasted for about uh, three centuries, okay? And China actually uh, can, um, established uh, and consolidated the rule over the Chinese heartland and expanded it somewhat. Um, and the next uh, can, uh, rise of China actually occurred uh, in the Tai Tang Dynasty, that was the 7th and 8th century. That, when, that was when China, actually, um, that was when the famous story, Journey to the West, uh, happened when the Chinese monk came to India to obtain the Buddhist uh, sutras, okay? So that was a period uh, in the eyes of many Chinese, the golden um, um, peak, or, or say the, the true peak of the Chinese history, when China was truly strong and it was really open um, at that time. And actually the Chinese capital, Chang'an, at that time, is a very cosmopolitan area, just like New York nowadays. And you can see China actually trading from many countries in the world, in the Middle East, and um, you can even see Africans um, came to China, and actually they have the name Kunlun Wu uh, in Chinese. Okay, so China at that, at that time actually was really uh, strong and open and had strong relations and influence uh, with neighboring countries. Okay, and uh, the third rise, um, according to Wang Gengwu, was the revival of Ming Dynasty. That was uh, when the Chinese rose up to overthrow the Mongolian rule um, in the 14th century, okay? And actually, China continued to grow stronger um, into the Qing Dynasty as well. 
But uh, sadly, China descended into the century of so-called foreign humiliations from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century. So similar to India, China also fell under Western uh, forces. Okay, when the Britons uh, colonized China, uh, India, they also went to China, and uh, China actually um, went into uh, numerous wars with various powers and was defeated quite badly. Okay, so that was kind of a very low uh, point in the Chinese history, and um, then the current rise which is really China's fourth rise in history, actually came, um, started since the late 1970s, okay? And this rise actually is a full dimensional rise for China, and um, it actually is achieved through China's growing strength in multiple dimensions, which included, uh, which re resulted, uh, resulted from China's economic reform and opening up, okay, since the late 1970s, and um, also through China's diplomatic efforts to reach out to the rest of the world, and she built up stronger relations and to strengthen its international status. But besides um, this, of course, China also underwent a strong uh, military modernization, okay, and we know that um, all the major powers they cannot become major without strong military force, right? So China also paid great attention to strengthen its military. And lastly, China also tries to build up its soft power and try to um, influence or um, exert more soft influence on other countries. But how successful that is, uh, well, yet to see. Okay, so overall, um, uh, today I'm going to uh, cover the different aspects of China's rise. But because uh, the last lecture uh, was mainly about China's diplomacy, so I will skip the diplomatic uh, outreach part. So I'll just focus on China's economic reform, um, economic rise, military rise, and um, increasing soft power. Okay. So first about uh, China's economic rise. I think China's economic rise lays the foundation for China's rise in other dimensions, okay? Without a strong economy, you cannot really rise up, right? So for the Chinese leadership, when they started to reform China, the first thing they did was to reform the economic system, okay? Well, why did China need to reform its economy? Well, I suppose um, the earlier lectures uh, in this program perhaps have uh, discussed a lot about this, right? Um, so I just try. Uh, I'll just be brief here. So the reason, the funda fundamental reason for China's economic reform is essentially the failure of the planned economy under the Maoist um, rule. Okay. Um, I know that uh, some of you may have very favorable feelings about socialist uh, system and uh, planned economy, but for our Chinese. Uh, uh, but for us Chinese, I'd say that's quite painful memory, okay? Actually, uh, when I was young, um, as a kid, I remember staying in very long queues for everything we need, like rice, like vegetable, like meat. We are just a uh, a very limited supply of these, um, the, the foodstuffs um, under the planned economy. Because all the planned economy, essentially, is shorted economy. Okay, when you when you plan everything, and oftentimes the plans cannot s fulfill the requirements of people's real need. Okay, so that was a quite uh, painful memory for many Chinese. Planned economy really did not work in supplying the stuff people need, and uh, also there's lack of production and managerial skills. Um, many Chinese factories, they are just inefficient. They don't run very well, and the managers, they don't really know how to run factories efficiently. So as a result, even if they want to produce something, they may not know how to do it, okay? And um, also, the Chinese economy was really isolated from the world economy. And you can see um, on the graph, the world trade actually picked up significantly in the 1970s, but China's share 
in the world trade actually keeps declining. This was due to China's um, split uh, from the Soviet Union, so it was isolated from the communist bloc, but it, also, it, is al it was also isolated from the Western world. So China didn't get participate in world trade in either um, camps. So the 19, early 1970s was uh, the worst period uh, in terms of Chinese participation uh, in the world economy. So realizing the problems, and uh, after the um, end of the last period, Deng Xiaoping came into power. Okay, He actually started major economic reforms from scratch. Well, the, we know that the Chinese reform strategy is uh, to, pro, uh, to cross the river by groping for stones. What the, does that mean? One step at a time. Okay, one step at a time, but without direction. Okay, essentially the reform strategy is no strategy. You just trial and error. Okay, so that's the first uh, characteristic of the of China's reform strategy, experimentalism. Okay, you first try something. If it, if it works, then it's promoted in um, um, across the country. Okay, and if it does not, then find out another way that works. So a lot of experiments of economic policies were carried out and encouraged in many Chinese localities. Okay, so the experiments are done made at the local level instead of at the central level. Okay, because the local governments, they know better about local conditions, about what's best for the local economy, right? So the Chinese top leaders, they kind of encourage this kind of bottom-up experimentation, okay? And so the successful experiences just gradually spread out across China from area to uh, other areas. So this comes to the second characteristic of Chinese reform, that is gradualism. So unlike the Soviet Union or Eastern European countries who took the Big Bang approach, China took a gradual approach. It did not just instantly abandon the planned economy. Instead, it implanted the so-called dual track system. Okay. So in addition, or say on top of the planned economy, there's also a market operating. So for example, if a factory, you can produce more than what you are required to, that is your quota, then you can sell your product on the market okay, for a higher price, of course. And uh, later, when production grows up, essentially, the Chinese economy grows out of the plant, um, the plants, right? And later, the market share um, of the economy just over um, um, shadows the planned economy, right? And so it's through this gradual approach that China gradually um, abandoned the planned economy and largely relied on market, a free market. Well, not, it's not exactly a 100% free market. The state still um, plays heavy hand uh, on it, but still um, the market largely um, uh, emerged. Okay, so this is the second very important feature of Chinese reform. It takes things slowly, okay, and gradually. And the reforms actually started from the coastal areas, okay, that's uh, better suited for international trade, and it's closer to Taiwan and Hong Kong, uh, which are two major um, engines of growth in Asia, right, we know that. Um, so the reforms um, gradually spread from the coastal area to the inland area. So that's the second feature, and lastly is pragmatism. Okay. Well, the Chinese reformers, um, led by Deng Xiaoping, they are very pragmatic. We know that in the past, China used to debate about whether China should go down the capitalist, I mean, the, the socialist um, path, or they should um, they should um, go back to the Maoist style planned economy, but with better planning. But when Deng Xiaoping um, famously um, argued that whether it's black cat or white cat, whichever cat that catches the mice is good cat, right? So you can see the pragmatic, um, 
pragmatism are showing up in the Chinese leaders' thinking. So whatever works should be adopted. Okay. So China didn't follow the classic economic textbook um, way of growth, like many uh, promoted um, in other developing countries, the so-called Washington Consensus. You first build up a free market and market institutions, and then um, your, your, your economy hopefully will grow. But China didn't follow that. Okay, So it just does whatever it believes that can work for China under China's local conditions. So overall, all these uh, features actually nicely um, grouped into the so-called the China model. Okay, so China's economic reforms actually do play out very well, and you can see China's economic growth is just marvelous in uh, since the 1980s, and it, its economy keeps growing with very high um, economic growth rate, um, averaged. Um, around 10% um, in the past few decades, and now the growth rate declines. Right? Naturally, when your economy grows um, bigger and bigger, the growth rate will decline. But still, nowadays, it's around 6% um, every year. So that's a quite um, a successful um, reform. And also, in terms of China's um, oops, okay. so trade with the world, China also participated more and more, and nowadays um, foreign trade actually takes up, um, account for more than half of China's GDP. So that means China really makes use of the global economic system okay, to its own advantage. Okay, So that's the first dimension, economic rise. And with, with, well, with money, now you can, what you can do with your military, that is, you want to strengthen your military capacity as well, right? Um, Actually, China's military system for a long time was number oriented. That is, they want to have a huge army, okay, and mainly ground force, but not necessarily high tech um, or a high quality. But uh, since the 1990s, China started to launch the so-called revolution in military affairs, okay. And um, do you know what prompted China to do that? What happened in the 1990s? The All of the Soviet Union, the unipolar world order with the US. OK, um, yes, the collapse of Soviet Union um, is one reason that prompted China to, um, to pay more attention to its security problem. But that's not one um, major reason why China wants to modernize its army. GDP? OK, yes, when well, you have money, of course, uh, you, you can afford military modernization, right? But what China, what really um, prompted Chinese leaders to rethink about their military capacity and military system is the U.S. operation in the Middle East. Okay, so we know that um, in the early 1990s, um, Iraq took Kuwait, and the U.S.-led army actually spent only very limited time and force, military force, to defeat Saddam. Okay. Within just a few days, with a lightning land uh, ground operation, the U.S. was able to disarm Saddam without no, I mean, without any in, um, casualties of the U.S. arms force, and that was actually a shock to the Chinese leaders. They never thought war can be fight uh, can be fought in this way, okay? Because in the past, Chinese wars all were won through um, really serious loss of lives, okay? So the Chinese leaders at that time started to pay more attention to modern military technique and to see how U.S. military operations um, were um, carried out in the Middle East and later in Kosovo and, uh, and later in Iraq, okay? So the Chinese leaders, they wanted to really upgrade their military and um, to, in order to do that, Jiang Zemin actually launched this so-called revolution in military affairs with the goal for China to win modern wars um, under high-tech uh, conditions. Okay, uh, Actually, now they realize that now large-scale uh, world wars are not likely. 
but rather words are of limited scale and contained within um, certain localities. Okay, so the Chinese army really needs to adapt to that kind of um, new conditions. Okay, so what did what did the Chinese government do? First, they increased the military expenditure. Okay, so military expenditure kept growing in the past um, two decades. And um, well, actually, this is one reason many other countries uh, criticize China for becoming more and more militant, right? But actually, if we compare Chinese military expenditure, it's just a small fraction of the U.S. military expenditure, okay? And uh, then the Chinese uh, leaders they pay more attention um, to the quality of the army rather than the quantity. So during the high time of, of Chinese army, there were more than seven million people in the military force, but that's really uh, not needed uh, in modern wars. So they started to cut down um, the military force. Now it's around 2 million, I think. Actually, I think last year uh, there was a large scale uh, cut, um, demobilization in the Chinese army, and I think it's uh, 300,000 uh, military uh, personnel were um, demobilized. So the size of the military is shrinking, but the quality is growing. Okay. So in the past, whoever who's um, strong and young could join the army, right? But nowadays, the Chinese um, government uh, raised the bar for education level. You need at least a high school um, degree and preferably even a university degree uh, to become a military officer. So they started to uh, improve the training of the military personnel and also they started to acquire more advanced technology and equipments okay, from Russia, from Israel, um, and of course China uh, learns a lot from other countries. Um, so, and, and you know that we Chinese um, are very good at reverse engineering. Okay, So whatever equipment we obtain from other countries like Russia, we just take it apart and then we can learn how it's made and put back, put it back perhaps with a better model. Okay, so this is, um, um, well, China actually does learn a lot um, from other countries about how to improve its military technology and equipments. Okay, and uh, also the Chinese army starts to pay more attention to telecommunication and information technology. Okay, I know Bangalore is the IT center of India because uh, to appreciate the, uh, use, uh, the value of IT right, and telecommunications. So the Chinese army also uh, realizes that too. So they start to uh, build up capacity uh, in this area, okay, like um, sending more satellites to the outer space. We know that when you fight wars, you really need a um, better communication system, right? Of course, you cannot rely on the American satellites to help you find the map or to find your way forward in battles, right? So the Chinese military, they developed their own uh, like GPS system, right? the global positioning uh, system, so as to better guide the uh, uh, ground operation. Um, so that's, that's it. And uh, also, the Chinese army grew from pure ground force to multi-dimensional power. That is, now it's n not just a ground force. There's Navy. There's um, air force, there's missile force, right? And the outer space also it plays more and more important role in modern uh, warfare. So we can see that, um, yeah, if you pay attention to um, the development, such kind of development in China, we know that China um, got its first aircraft carrier, right? And now it's building its second one. Um, so China is trying to strengthen its naval uh, projection power, okay, so that it, its army not, is no longer constrained in the mainland. So its military force can be projected to far away places. So for example, if China wants to claim South China Sea, it has to have the projection power to send troops to South China Sea, right? But so far, actually, um, its capacity is limited. So that's why aircraft carriers become very important, okay? So these are the major uh, strategies for China to modernize its military. Okay, but um, what are the goals? Well, some people may worry that uh, why China is building its army? Is it going to invade any other countries? Well, I'd say 
at least so far, no. Okay, the priority is still regime security. Okay, a major goal or the major purpose of the Chinese military force is to preserve regime stability. Okay, and um, if you look at the uh, distribution of military um, troops in China, they are over near major cities. Okay, serve to make sure the major cities like Beijing, like Shanghai, they are safe. Okay, from attacks from abroad. And um, also, of course, territorial integrity is a major purpose. China wants to make sure it can hold the country together if needed. For example, like in Xinjiang, when there is East Turkestan independence movement and when there is rising uh, terrorism, so China wants to make sure these places are, are still under tight control of the party state. Okay. And uh, of course, the national unification, that is, to have Taiwan in mind, China never gives up the use of military force to reunify Taiwan. So although it doesn't plan to um, have a war on Taiwan anytime soon, but still it needs to be pre military prepared. Okay. And uh, China does want to have the military capacity to conquer Taiwan if needed. And actually, China was quite humiliated in 1996 um, during the Taiwan Strait Crisis. Does anyone know what happened at that time? That's, uh, that's, that's too, too long ago and too far away. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, so at that time, uh, China used its military um, uh, forces. Well, it, it claimed to have uh, some kind of military exercise, mainly to threaten Taiwan. Okay. But uh, later, what happened? The US sent two aircraft carriers into the Times Street, and China suddenly come down. That came as a huge humiliation to China, OK? So that's why actually one reason why China started to pay more attention to naval uh, build up and to strengthen its naval force. But in any case, so Taiwan is uh, one crucial um, goal in China's military uh, modernization, okay, it does want to make sure it has the capacity to recover Taiwan if needed, okay. And um, next, maritime security, okay. We know that uh, China's uh, coastal uh, area are uh, um, is the most well, most of the wealthiest uh, places in China is along the coast, right? China needs to protect them. And uh, nowadays, with increasing international trade, China also sees increasing need to protect the sea lanes of um, communications, to make sure the ships, the shipping um, products to China will be safe, right? And uh, so that does need some kind of uh, naval projection power. So maritime security is one important, an increasingly important goal, and lastly, China also has a stake in maintaining regional stability. Just think about North Korea. Okay, what if a nuclear war breaks out? China does need to have the capacity to contain damage and to make sure China um, can do something to um, maintain the regional stability to a uh, large degree. Okay, and not only North Korea, and also in the south uh, west border with Myanmar. We see um, there, there were some uh, unrest in the past, right? So China need to have the capacity to maintain stability in the um, neighboring air countries as well, so that China can have a safe environment for its own development. Okay. So with all these strategic goals, China is um, kind of um, modernizing its army. Okay. So that is uh, China's military rights. But we know that um, countries cannot become a major power if they only have military power. Right? You must have some kind of um, soft influence, where say you need to have the capacity to convince others and to make yourself attractive so that others want to just follow you instead of being coerced by you. Right? So China also starts to um, build up its soft power to a certain degree. Um, so there are uh, several sources of China's soft power. Okay. 
One major source is diplomacy. Okay, as we uh, discussed earlier today, China actually has done a lot to improve its diplomatic relations with other countries, to make friends, and to present China as a good uh, and responsible partners, right, to many other countries. And uh, we know that uh, Panda also plays a very important role, right? China uses a uh, a panda diplomacy quite uh, successfully. Uh, where, wherever you see pandas go, you should know that China is trying to improve relationship with this country. Okay. Um, so diplomacy actually um, does help uh, China um, to attract um, many friends. Okay, and uh, perhaps some uh, followers. Okay, and um, so that's diplomacy. But besides that, I would say um, domestic institutions and uh, policies work in the world. The China model also helps China to attract some followers. Well, we know that China's reforms have um, appeared to be largely successful, so that um, China emerges as kind of an uh, alternative of development of development paths to many developing countries. So countries now will go to China, um, like Brazil or um, African countries, they went to China to learn about the Chinese experiences and try to adapt the China model to their own countries. So in this way, actually, China, the China model um, does help China gain more soft influence um, among developing countries. Okay. And um, lastly, China does have very rich culture and long history, just like India does. So China, the Chinese government is also increasingly making use of that to um, make China appear more attractive to foreigners so that people will come to China and know more about China. And hopefully when they go back to their home countries, they can help shape um, their foreign policies, right? So. Just like India has yoga, China has its martial arts, right? So you can see actually a lot of foreigners come to China to learn martial arts, and the Chinese couple movies are also making um, impacts on the global market. So Chinese uh, government is trying to promote all kinds of cultural exchanges, and China also hosts like uh, world class um, events like the Olympics to attract people to uh, come to China and to understand the Chinese uh, system better. Okay, so in some sense, these attempts help more and more foreigners to come um, to China and to know China better. And I think um, that's, that's helpful, okay. Yeah, the list in the past, uh, when I uh, went abroad, people would ask me all kinds of weird questions uh, but nowadays, it seems um, the outside world knows more and more about China and uh, what Chinese people think and uh, what the Chinese system is like. And I think a mutual understanding lays a good foundation for a country's um, a positive image um, in, in the eyes of foreigners. Okay, so I would say um, this uh, is a good attempt. Um, but still, we have to realize that there are all kinds of limits um, of China's soft power. Okay, so, um, well, first of all, while we all acclaim the China model, we have to realize that uh, the model is flawed. Okay, although the Chinese economy grows very um, strong, it comes with all kinds of costs, like environmental damages. Okay, there's heavy pollution in a lot of places. Um, and um, that actually costs huge damage people's health. Okay. And also there's um, growing corruption everywhere. And um, it's kind of um, <coughs> the traditional Chinese value um, gets lost in the way of modernization. So many Chinese now, they actually miss the old days. They talk about the Republican uh, period in uh, uh, in the early 20th, um, 20th century, they missed the period before China became modern and strong. Okay, 
So there are all kinds of problems with China's development model. So how convincing or say how um, uh, useful China, the China model really is to other countries is questioned. Okay. And secondly, China's illiberal political system actually prevents it to be um, a really convincing um, uh, to, well, the, the liberal political system actually prevents China uh, from convincing other people that it's really a good or a great power. We know that with all kinds of human rights issues, with um, this uh, like media censorship, well, how, what we learn from the Chinese media about China may bias, right? Other people may question the uh, credibility of what we hear and see about China. And um, more importantly, the illiberal, illiberal political system is crumbling people's creativity. Okay. When you have a strong state control and people and the media and the education system and people's thinking is really, um, I think it's counterproductive uh, for innovation or um, all kinds of creativity. Um, things. So I don't think um, in the long run this will um, play a positive role in China's future development in terms of innovation. Okay. Um, and uh, next, about diplomacy. Yes, diplomacy uh, does help China gain a lot of friends um, in the world. But we have to realize that the Chinese diplomacy actually narrowly focuses on economic diplomacy. Okay. When China builds up economic, I mean, uh, diplomatic relations, economics all, always comes first. And China makes friends by what? Giving foreign aid, okay, to give financial assistance to other countries. Instead of exporting its values, it's the export of financial aid that helps China gain friends. But as we Chinese say, the friends gain through economic means are just friends of wine and uh, meat, or okay? They're not really reliable, okay? So when you can no longer hand out interest to them, they are no longer your friends, right? So without a culture, or say, without a value system that's truly appealing to other countries and other peoples, it's hard for China to really have strong soft power. So that boils down to the last point. The lack of, there is a lack of coherent Chinese value. So when we think about the American value, well, liberty, democracy come into mind. But when we talk about Chinese value, what comes to mind? I have no idea. Socialism? <laughs> well, well, actually, I, I, I don't think any, many Chinese people really believe in socialism anymore. OK. Uh, so, but when we talk about Chinese culture, what, what Chinese value, what is it? Confucianism? No, not really. Um, so there's yet to be a truly coherent value system that many Chinese uh, people would embrace. OK. China is still in search for such a uh, value system, I would say. Okay, so that, I think that's the fundamental weakness of China's soft power. Okay, all right. So after talking um, about China's rise um, in multiple dimensions, next uh, we will look at China's evolving worldviews. Okay, and actually how China views the world and views itself changed a lot in the past um, like 60 or 70 years. So from the Maoist period, okay, starting in the 1950s, well, China, yes, it, as a socialist country, it did uphold the socialist or Marxist Leninist ideology, okay. It views the world largely in two, as two camps, okay, the socialist versus uh, the imperialist camp, right, and China actually allied with the socialist camp and sought to um, struggle against the capitalist or say the imperialist camp, right? Um, but later on, um, with the Sino-Soviet split, actually China started to grow independent from um, the Soviet Union. It, Mao Zedong actually started to promote his own ideology or say his, his own worldview. 
That is the so-called three words uh, theory. Does anyone know what three words are? The first, yes, first, second, and the third. Yeah, but what are they? Okay, so the first world contains two countries, the U.S. and the USSR, okay, we'll say the Soviet Union, okay. The second world, the, the European countries, or say the followers uh, of the, um, the two superpowers, right, and the third world is the developing world. Right, the countries that Mao Zedong hopes can rise up to struggle against the repression of the superpowers as well as some uh, second world um, countries. I think that theory is uh, still quite influential uh, in many parts of the world. Okay, in any case, that is China's view. Yes. Okay, that is um, the Chinese uh, version about the world system. Okay, under the Mao's years. Okay, what, whether it's two camp or three words, we can see that the ideology under the most, um, during the most years, they were largely about struggle and conflict, right? But um, since the end of the most years, oh, you can see the uh, posters, I should, all the people in the world unite to um, fight against the American imperialists and the Soviet revisionists and um, down with the counter-revolutionaries in all the world. So that's the poster from the Cultural Revolution. Okay. You can see the Maoist ideology, um, which was um, very strong during those years. But uh, since the end of the Maoist rule and the rise of Deng Xiaoping, well, the ideas fundamentally changed. Okay. Into the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping realized that major war, uh, war wars are no longer likely. Okay? Instead, peace and the development, they become the priorities. Okay? So instead of the East-West issue, the North-South issue become, uh, became dominant. So what is the East-West issue? Yes. Right. So basically, this, uh, the communist um, camp versus the socialist camp versus the, the capitalist camp. Okay, that's the divide between the east and the west. Okay. Now, what about the south, north south issue? Developed and developing countries. Exactly. Okay. So to Deng Xiaoping, um, he believed that the north south issue, that is the divide between the developed world and the developing world, is the most urgent uh, and important issue that China um, and the world should deal with. Okay, so now it's no longer time for um, war um, along ideological lines, but rather it's about development, okay? China should participate um, in peace and development rather than preparing for war, as uh, China did during the most years. So China started well, that's why uh, you can see uh, this goes up with the background of China's economic and uh, uh, reform and opening up, right? Okay, and um, then China also started to formulate more independent foreign policy. So we know that during the Cold War period, China either aligned with the Soviet Union or later uh, the United States. But um, now China wants to have non-alignment. That is, China will become no one's ally. Okay, rather it will be more independent in its foreign policy making. And uh, this is uh, also the period that we see a revival of pragmatism. Okay, so during the modest years, actually, China sent out a lot of uh, financial and military assistance to other communist or um, uh, socialist countries just for ideological reasons. But when Deng Xiaoping came into power as a very pragmatic leader, he just dropped all these kind of um, foreign um, um, policies on ideological basis. Rather, he would uh, do things more for economic benefit. Okay, whatever that's good for China's economic reform and development, China would pursue the policies. So the revival of pragmatism become 
more and more are prominent in China's um, um, foreign policy making and its world leaders. But actually, this uh, I would say this is a revival of the Chinese tradition. Okay, pragmatism actually is a very important element in the Chinese culture and, and tradition. Well, many Chinese people they would do things out of pragmatic reason rather than out of religious or other um, um, moral reasons, okay, I would say. Um, so that's in the 1980s, okay. And um, into 1990s, actually we saw a very uh, um, notable rise of Chinese nationalism. Why is that? I think this has to do with the end of Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union and other communist countries. And also, uh, in particular, the Tiananmen Square incident, the 18, 19, 1899, I mean, uh, 1989. So China, the Chinese government actually sensed a serious loss of regime legitimacy and the regime support among the Chinese pop um, population. So how can it, again, summon up the people um, to support itself? The Chinese Communist Party actually try to play with nationalism, okay? And um, so into the 90, uh, mid and mid and late 1990s, you actually see a strong rise of Chinese nationalism, okay? That actually contains uh, several elements, okay? First, it's about national pride. Well, I, I think this is the same for all countries in the world, right? All people, um, they naturally would have some high, um, they hold some pride for their own country, right? But for China, what's different is about China's high aspirations. Because China, for a long period of time, it was at the center of the world, as it called itself, the Middle Kingdom, right? It's on top of the world. So now it's time for China to revive and to come back as a major power, or say as a... Um, as a major power on top of the world, okay, China should, uh, all Chinese people should aspire to that. Actually, we still see that in the so-called Chinese, Chinese dream that Xi Jinping promotes nowadays, right? So he believes that China should revive and become great power again, but just like what Trump says, make America greater again. Um, so it's similar here, okay. And the second important element in the Chinese nationalism is the emphasis on sovereignty, okay? China has always emphasized that it should have full control over its territory and no foreigners should interfere in China's internal affairs. And if you uh, pay attention to the press conference of the Chinese foreign ministry, you probably can hear that kind of saying very frequently, okay? So China always resists other countries' uh, meddling of its internal affairs and uh, you insist that sovereignty should be respected by other countries, okay? And uh, another very interesting element uh, in Chinese nationalism, as some argues, is the emphasis on moral principles, okay? So um, China, or say um, Chinese foreign policy makers, they believe that foreign policies should be made on the basis or say in uh, alignment with moral principles, okay? Um, and um, for example, China often criticized um, the US sales of um, weapons to Taiwan on the principle that it is disturbing peace in the, in the region, okay? So instead of saying, you are hurting my national interests, China would say, you are doing this um, morally wrong things, okay? So moral principles are often um, mentioned as something, um, or as a basis for countries to deal with each other and for uh, foreign policy uh, making. So this is quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure um, this is uh, really, um, but there is a sincerity in this claim of, of um, um, moral principles or is more symbolic, because we also know that China often does things that are not exactly morally right, right? So moral principles may be um, violated for pragmatic reasons as well. But in any case, um, 
there's something uh, notable um, in China's um, in the Chinese nationalistic um, uh, ideology. Uh, lastly, Chinese nationalism um, has this kind of a hypersensitivity, um, especially to foreign criticism and uh, status issues. Okay, so I guess um, no one likes to be criticized. But China, or say many Chinese people, especially get irritated if the criticism comes from a foreigner. Okay, they also believe that this is our internal affairs. Okay, you should not uh, interfere our internal affairs. So you have no right to criticize us. If we have any problems, we will handle it ourselves. Okay, so this kind of hypersensitivity uh, really shows up um, in. Yeah, again, the, the, the press conferences of, of the Chinese foreign ministry. If you listen to their speeches, you can often uh, sense this kind of a sensitivity to foreign uh, criticism. And also, China is very sensitive to status issues. For example, on Taiwan, China insists that Taiwan is only par part of China, so Taiwan should not be allowed into major international organizations. So it's trying every means to block Taiwan uh, from entering or say, joining international organizations. And also, China, Chinese people often get very um, irritated about the Asukuni Shrine. You know, that's a shrine in Japan uh, that worship um, some of um, its war criminals. But of, of course, for, from the Japanese perspective, the Yasukuni Shrine is something, um, is where they can worship their ancestors, right? But for Chinese people, whenever some Japanese leaders visit Yasukuni Shrine, they are always, um, the Chinese people often get very angry, okay? They always protest. But um, this kind of visit doesn't really mean any major shift in Japan's foreign policy towards China, right? But it's more like a symbolic issue. But for many Chinese, that's just unacceptable. So from such kind of incidents, you can see the hypersensitivity um, in the Chinese nationalism. Okay, so that's I, I think that's very interesting. Okay, so that's uh, in, in the 1990s, but into the 21st century, with China's um, rising power, we can see that China starts to be more uh, become more um, confident. Okay, so. Instead of just uh, complaining about outside world and protesting about their interference uh, um, in China's domestic affairs, China starts to propose something to the world. Okay, so this shows up in the so-called harmonious um, notion, and currently, um, well, the harmonious notion was uh, proposed by Hu Jintao, okay, the fourth generation leader of China, and now it becomes the so-called community of shared future for mankind. Uh, the Lei Mi Gong Tong Ti. I think you have heard of this term uh, multiple times by Xi Jinping. Okay, so the, the the notions they, although they are in different terms, um, but they have um, same, I mean, very similar um, meanings inside. Okay, one that is the emphasis on multilateralism. Well, what does China have in mind when promoting multilateralism. The U.S. Okay, so China is dissatisfied with the U.S. unilateralism. Okay, the U.S. just does whatever it, it wants, right? To um, uh, overthrow Saddam's uh, regime in Iraq without solid evidence, and um, to look, uh, to do various things on unilateral um, ground. So China instead tries to promote multilateralism as a way to solve many of the world's problems. So for example, China argues that uh, countries should use multilateralism to realize common security. That is, we should solve security problems like North Korea uh, nuclear issues uh, through multilateral negotiation. Okay, more through peaceful negotiation and consultation than through unilateral military attack. Okay, so China believed that countries should come together to talk and to try to find a consensus instead of just one country um, making a unilateral move and imposing it on other countries. So that is China's stance. Um, 
although we know that the six-party talk, uh, which China uh, tries to um, promote, doesn't really work out very well. Okay, so but that shows China's approach to solving many uh, global issues. And uh, secondly, China wants to promote the mutually beneficial cooperation to achieve common prosperity. So China always tried to um, promote so-called win-win situation. So everyone can gain from cooperation. So this view um, actually um, runs in a sharp contrast with a zero-sum view about the world. So basically China believes um, the world is not a zero-sum game, okay? And uh, ra rather it's a positive-sum game. And if countries come together, everyone can gain something. Okay, so that's a quite optimistic view about the world. And um, also China um, tries to promote the spirit of inclusiveness. That is, <coughs> countries should respect each other's culture, uh, differences in culture, in history, in value system, instead of trying to impose your own value on other countries. Okay, here again, US is in mind, okay. So countries should respect each other's different uh, social, culture, um, cultural systems, okay? And um, developing countries, they should be respected more in international organizations, etc. So basically, China, um, through this um, either a harmonious world or a community of shared future for mankind, China tries to promote an alternative way um, that is multilateralism and inclusiveness to solve many global issues. Okay. And um, oh, okay. And uh, lastly, okay, I do want to mention this. China actually turns from a rule follower to agenda set. Okay. You can see China is increasingly promoting this kind of um, other um, initiatives, the BRICS. Right, on how what BRICS is, right? China becomes quite active participant in BRICS activities and uh, even formulated um, this uh, development bank um, for BRICS. So basically, it's uh, to help promote development in these uh, five countries Brazil, um, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa. Yes. So China actually. Um, become a major um, pushing force uh, become, uh, of many um, initiatives behind BRICS. But besides that, China starts to promote its own vision about global cooperation and development. That is the One Belt, One Road initiative. You can see um, that's actually a major initiative that Chinese government tries to promote in the recent years. And basically, um, the initiative includes the Silk uh, uh, Road Economic Belt on land that, linking, uh, that links China to Central Asia and then to Europe. And then there's another maritime Silk Road uh, from China to, to, through Southeast Asia and India and then all the way to Africa and then to Europe. So that's a very ambitious initiative that links China with many other countries along the Belt and the Road. Okay, you could say uh, that's a really a major move that China tries to promote. Now, of course, there's domestic reason behind that. That is China's excess production capacity in infrastructure con uh, construction and uh, other uh, industries. So, because China so now doesn't need so much um, production or infrastructure uh, is construction. It tries to export its capacity to other countries along the road and the belt to help other countries build up their infrastructure. And uh, for that reason, so China promoted um, this Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank that turned out to be a huge success involving not only China, but also India, Russia, South Korea, etc. Over um, in total, um, 57 countries in the world joined this bank. And actually, the U.S. tried to boycott the, uh, the the bank by not joining. But it turned out its most faithful ally, Germany, France, and uh, United Kingdom, they all joined. So that turned out to be 
a uh, total mistake on the U.S. side. So for China, it became a quite successful um, publicity project at least so far. Um, so you can see that China becomes more confident and assertive and tries to initiate its own views of, and vision about the world. Okay, in conclusion, while well, China has risen, okay, it's a country that rises from a low point, from a center of foreign humiliation. And I think that's quite um, inspiring for many countries uh, in the world, uh, like India. And it's a country that tries, that rises by domestic reforms and foreign trade, okay? So I would say domestic reforms are really the foundation of China's rise on the international stage. And it's a country that failed to challenge the global system, but later learned to embrace it. Okay, and uh, it's, a con it's a power that s seeks to alter the rules of the game. Okay, now China is no longer satisfied with just following others, especially the Western powers. Instead, it wants to alter the rules of the game by proposing its new, uh, its own uh, initiatives. Okay, and it's becoming increasingly internationally powerful. But China is also a country that is yet to take up more international responsibility. We say that with great power comes with great responsibility, but China has yet to come up to that. Although it's becoming a very powerful country, it's still reluctant to take up many international responsibilities commensurate to its power. China doesn't want to become the next America. It doesn't want to become the hegemon, the so-called hegemon. So, this is something we all need to think about, where China is going in the future. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you.